Many of you have heard the story about when, about two years ago, when the car I was driving almost exploded, but uh, allow me to tell it again in case you've already heard it. I was, uh, I went to Charleston, South Carolina. I actually went over to South Carolina for a church conference and then went to Charleston to, to visit some friends. And I was driving back west towards Memphis on Saturday. And I decided it would be fun. This was about two years ago, so it was a couple months after we had Avery. I decided it would be fun for Colleen to fly into Atlanta and us to spend like a weekend together, like a, oh, hey, nice to see you again. Haven't seen you in a couple of months, kind of weekend after, you know, having a baby and adjusting to that. So I was driving from Charleston to Atlanta, and Colleen was about to board an airplane, and I was running a couple minutes late as usual. And so I'd done the math in my head about how fast I needed to drive to cover the miles I needed to cover to get there about the time she walked out of the airport. And so I'm going a little faster than the speed limit, and all of a sudden I look down, and you know that little temperature gauge that tells you how hot your engine is? It's supposed to be right in the middle. It was all the way over in the red. And so I saw that, and I nailed the brakes, pulled over to the side of the road, turned the car off as quick as I could, and opened up the hood, because I know that that's a great way to destroy your car, is just to let it run hot. So I sat there, and I called Colleen, and she's at the airport. She's like, do you want me to get on the plane? you don't want me to get on the plane? I'm like, I don't know what to do. I just told her to get on the plane, and I got the car running cool enough so that I could get it at least to the gas station that was a mile down the road. Ended up having to call AAA. AAA towed me back to Columbia, South Carolina, which is three hours away from Atlanta. They got the car back there, and they discovered what had happened. It had blown a gasket. But the problem was, it was Saturday afternoon, and their service department was going to close in a couple hours. They couldn't get me back on the road in the car in time. And so the guy said, what I'll do is I'll have one of my drivers drive you to the Columbia Airport, and we'll put you in a rental car, and you can drive to Atlanta and spend the weekend with your wife. I was like, well, that's great, except for the fact I've got to drive three hours in the opposite direction of Memphis on Monday morning to pick the car up. But nevertheless, I was like, you know what, just get me to Atlanta, this, we can try to salvage this thing, whatever. And so they had one of the porters drive me out to the airport. Well, at that point, I'm just spent, I'm tired, I'm, not, I'm just trying to have conversation with the guy. Don't know what I'm saying, don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I get to the airport, rent the car, drive to Atlanta. Well, on Monday, got to drive three hours back to Columbia to pick the car up. And I'm a little frustrated that I'm driving six hours out of my way in my little Toyota Corolla rental car to go get this car that exploded on me outside of Columbia. But I drive to the Columbia airport, I drop the rental car off, and the guy who drove me on Saturday picks me up at the airport to drive me back to the dealership. Well, this time I'm a little bit more with it. I'm not, like, stressed about everything. I know that Colleen's back in Memphis and everything's fine. And so I'm driving, I'm driving with him. He's driving me. We're about 35 minutes away from the dealership, and we're just chatting, and we're just talking. And he is asking me, he goes, so what is it that you do? And I go, oh, well, I'm a pastor. We started the church about a year ago in Memphis. And at that point, like, no small talk. He was like, okay, you're a pastor. I've got two questions for you. Like, man, we're not even going to, like, muddy the water. Like, we're just going to jump right in. We're not even going to wade a little bit into it. He goes, I got two questions for you. He goes, what do you think about racism? And I'm like, okay, well, I, I think that racism is a sin. I think it's a disgusting sin because God created all humans in his image and his likeness. And to say that one is better than the other simply based on their skin color is sinful and wrong. And he's like, okay, I, I, I see that. And I told him some scriptures. I talked about you know Genesis 1, God creating a man in, in, in his own image. And so we're all created in his image. And we went to Ephesians 2, and I talked a little bit about that. And so then he asked me, he goes, okay, here's my other question, and this is the bigger one. He goes, what do you think about homosexuality? What do you think about homosexuality? And at that moment, I'm like, man, you really, like, you just hit for the fences with this. Like, you're not even trying to, to wade slowly into the water. And so fortunately, I had about 20 to 25 minutes to just unpack to him what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. And, and I, I truly believe that God's Word did a work in that $100,000 BMW 7 Series that he drove me back to the dealership in. Because by the time we got to the dealership, he looked at me and he goes, you know what? If all Christians believe the Bible as you just explained it, I believe there's hope for the church. Mm. I believe there's hope for the church. This was a non-Christian. Like this was somebody on the outside looking in. And when he heard somebody who believes all of the Bible, hear me, believe Romans 1, believe 1 Corinthians 6, believe Mark chapter 10 that we're going to talk about, and unpacked all of Scripture, said, I see what the Bible has to say now. And I thought that was so encouraging because there's two reasons I thought that was encouraging. First is this. It made me realize we're all going to have to answer that question. 
If you profess to be a Christian today, you're going to have to answer that question to people who don't know Jesus. Because that is the hot button, hot topic issue that is everywhere. All the talking heads, CNN, Fox News, everybody is chatting about it. I mean, you just turn the TV on, get on your social media feeds, and you just see people all over the place talking about this issue. And for me as the pastor of this church to not equip our church to understand how to navigate this question, I believe is a disservice to you guys. And so we're going to unpack the scriptures today because we're all going to have to answer this question. But the second thing is this, I believe that when we see what all of Scripture talks about, we, we really can articulate it in a way that truly shows the love of Jesus Christ and the truth of Jesus Christ. Because I don't know about you, but it, it was like until I got to college before I heard an entire sermon on this topic that really unpacked it in a way that takes all of Scripture into account. Not just Romans 1 and not just 1 Corinthians 6. And so what I know in doing this is that there's going to be people in this room who disagree. There's going to be people who will eventually watch this online who will disagree. And what I'm going to ask all of us to do is just to allow the Bible to speak to us this morning. Just allow the Bible to speak to us this morning. And when you get uncomfortable, if you begin to disagree, if you begin to push back, especially Christian, if you begin to think, oh, whoa, where's he going with this? Let the scriptures speak to you. Allow God to speak to us this morning. So, we've got a lot to cover. And it's going to take us all of our time, if not more, to do so. So let's go ahead and get started. Number one, if you're taking notes, is this. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? That's, where we're, that's, that's the foundation for where we're going. That's what we're going to talk about. What does the truth of Scripture say? And truth is important. We all want to know what the truth is, right? I love cars, as many of you know. And one of the things that I've, I've read about cars is that cars, and, and noticed about cars too, is that cars get better gas mileage these days, right? I got to, that's a good thing. That's a win for everybody. It's a win for the consumer. It's a win for the environment. If you're putting less fuel in your car and you go the same distance, woohoo, you win. Okay. But here's the deal, in order for automakers to get their cars to take less fuel but produce the same amount of power, they've got to have smaller engines. And smaller engines, especially on sporty cars, do not sound very sporty. Imagine you drop 80 G's on a sports car and it goes, you're like, that doesn't, I could have bought a Civic and it would have sounded the same way, right? Like, and so sports cars have traditionally sounded throaty and sounded loud. Whenever you hear a loud car, it's either like a nice sports car, some redneck with flow masters on his truck, or a guy with a Civic who's drilled a hole in his muffler. Like that's what a loud sounding car usually is. And so sports car manufacturers know that consumers want to hear their engine. But their engines don't make much noise, so what are they to do? They've created software that monitors how you're driving your car and then pipes fake engine noises into your car so that you feel like you're driving something that sounds louder than it actually is. But I've read that if you go and pull the fuse for the radio, then all of a sudden your car that sounded throaty and loud, it sounds eerily quiet. Why? Because that sound that you're hearing isn't actually truly being made by the car. It's being falsely made by the radio. It's being falsely made by the computers in the car. It's not the truth. And me personally, I don't think I'd like that. Like, I want it the, the car to be naturally loud. Like, I want to wake the neighbors up when I turn my car on, not because I've had to turn my speakers up, right? Like, that's just my personality. I want the truth. I don't want just kind of this fake noise. But I point to some of you like, why are you talking about this? Here's the reason I'm talking about this. Because out there in the world today, there's so much noise. Especially in regards to this topic. There's so much noise on social media, on 24-hour news. It's everywhere. And it will only continue to be that way over the next upcoming months. I can guarantee you that. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got a stance. Everybody is taking the social media and talking about what they believe. And they're posting articles and things like that. But here's, once again, the invitation I have for us. Let's set aside all the noise that we hear and look at truth. Because here's the thing I know about noise. It only is certain noises that we're hearing. It's not even a total picture of what's going on out there. I'll give you an example. Chase actually sent me this a couple months ago. I thought it was fascinating. Y'all remember about a year, year and a half ago, 
when Dan Cathy got on and said that he believed in traditional biblical marriage between a man and a woman for a lifetime. So he gets on, he says that, and then, like, the world erupts, right? Mm -hmm. Like, both sides. Like, everybody's burning everything, and everybody's going crazy, and that is what it is. And then about a week later, there's five-hour lines wrapped around Chick-fil-A's, and people are having traffic accidents because they're trying to avoid the lines of Chick-fil-A's. And then everybody's re responding to that, and everybody's going nuts about all of that. But there was something else happening that not very many people picked up on. And as far as I know, I mean, no major news organization picked up on it. Behind the scenes, Dan Cathy, who still stands by what he said, was seeking out people who disagreed with them in order to understand them and to really try to build bridges instead of burn them. One of those men, his name was Shane Windmeyer, and he wrote an article on the Huffington Post. You can go and read it. He wrote an article, and it's entitled, Dan and Me, My Coming Out as a Friend of Dan Cathy and Chick-fil-A. And the interesting thing about the author, Shane, he is an open homosexual, and he is a leader of, actually, it's called Campus Pride, and it's, a, it's an organization that's on college campuses that is for homosexuals and friends of those organizations. And in this article, he talks about how Dan Cathy approached him and sat down with him and took a genuine interest in his life. And he, he says this, I'll read, this is a quote from the article. You can Google it later if you want. <laughs> But he says this, Dan, uh, Shane says this, I will not change my views and Dan will not likely change his. But we can continue to listen, learn, and appreciate the blessing of growth that happens when we know each other better. And there's a lot of different things we can pull from that. There's a man who, who took a biblical stance and is still loving somebody who disagrees with him. But at the same time, I just say this to say that like the world blew up when Dan Cathy issued what he said. But nobody really was talking. I mean, when Chase sent me this, he was like, why aren't people talking about this? And I was thinking, I mean, maybe just because it's not very volatile. I mean, it's not interesting to see two people who disagree and still disagree still sitting down peacefully and having a conversation. You can't lead the news with that. And so I point that out because there's still a lot going on that isn't being talked about out in the world. And so that's why it's so incredibly important that we not let the world even our own desires or our own opinions dictate how we should handle this. We've got to go to God's Word. So, with that being said, let's see, what, let's see what God's Word has to say. This is Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. This is the text that has launched us into our marriage series, and this is the reason we're talking about this this morning. Verse 6, this is Jesus speaking. He says, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let man not separate. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. We as a trust, church, we trust the word of God as inerrant and infallible. We believe that it is accurate. We believe that God has preserved it exactly the way that he wants us to preserve it. And let me tell you why one of the reasons I just believe this, just thinking about Jesus. Because we worship a, a guy who was born of a virgin, lived 33 years, was crucified, and then walked out of the tomb. Forty days after he walked out of the tomb, he ascended into heaven. I've never seen anybody do that. Like, like, have you? Like, none of us have ever seen anybody do that. And I believe in doing that, he was showing us that he was God. And so... If he can walk out of the tomb, he can correctly preserve his word for us today. Which is why I look at his word and I go, it means what it says and it says what it means. When I look at Jesus' words, I say, it means what it says and it says what it means. And what Jesus just said is he talked about how marriage, he's actually quoting Genesis 1 and 2 and then talking about it himself. So he's affirming what happened in Genesis 1 and 2. And he says that marriage is one man, one woman for one lifetime. That's what I believe. That's what this church believes. That's what I believe the Bible teaches. That's what I believe Jesus teaches. Now, Jesus, listen to me. Jesus was not a friend of just, you know, making everybody happy and holding the status quo. If there was something that needed to be corrected, Jesus had no problem doing so. You know how I know that? Because they crucified him. And they crucified him, not because he towed the company line, but because he kept telling them things they didn't want to hear. And so if Jesus wanted to show us that God intended something different from marriage than what he says here, he could have just said it, and I believe he would have just said it. But he didn't. This is what Jesus said. 
But the Bible isn't silent beyond this fact. I want to read to you two more verses. This is Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Paul writes this. He says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And right here in this text, we see Paul talking about lesbianism and homosexuality, and he talks about it in a negative light. And the thing that I would push back on somebody who would say, okay, well, I believe the Bible, but I don't believe the Bible condemns this act. What do you do with these verses? Like, you have to do something with them. And I believe to hold, hold any sort of, like, biblical accountability and to, to use right interpretation techniques, I mean, you just look at this and on, at face value it means what it means. And so that's Romans 1. And so we look at that and we see that thing. But there's one more verse I want to read to you. And this is where we're going to take a little bit of a turn. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-10 through 10 say this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, so there's our topic right there, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I love this. Let me say a couple things about it, and then we'll, we'll turn this a little bit. Paul says, do not be deceived. Do you see that? He says that right before he gets into his list. I love that because the Bible knows us better than we know ourselves. Why? Because God knows us better than we know ourselves, and he wrote the thing. He knows that there's going to be times where these things that are listed are going to look to the world like they're okay. He knows that there's going to be a season when theft looks like it's fine. And there's going to be people who think theft is okay. He knows that there's going to be a time when idolatry looks like it's okay and there's going to be a time for us that idolatry looks like it's fine. But Paul says, listen, don't be deceived. There is coming a time where you will think that these things are right, both you personally and your culture, but don't be deceived. Because if we can rewind the world about 100 years or fast forward 100 years, we would see that the argument probably not about homosexuality, it might be about something else on this list where people are like, no, 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 that's fine. You, you could do that, that's fine. And Paul's like, no, 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 don't be deceived. Because Satan's constantly at work. He's constantly deceiving us. The world is constantly lying to us. Paul says, don't be deceived. Now, here's the deal. Homosexuality is on that list. It's on that list. And in the Greek, it means what it says, and it says what it means. But there's other things on that list, too. Let's talk for a minute. Some of you might notice that I sound a little bit nasally. The reason I sound a little bit nasally is because there's two small children that live in my house, and they get sick all the time. So Colleen and I were constantly sick. Well, actually, this time, Colleen was the one who in injected this, this virus into our family. But Colleen, I think, picked it up at work. So last week, Colleen came home, and she was feeling pretty ill. I told some of you about this. But she had a cold and all this upper respiratory stuff that actually resulted in my wife having migraines. Now, she's never had migraines before. Room was spinning. Head was hurting. She was, like, throwing. Like, it was just a bad situation for her. And there was two nights last week where she was so ill that she couldn't get out of bed to help me put the girls to bed. First night was complete disaster. <gasps> you know, like, just crazy. I'm like, oh, the rapture. Like, you know, just like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Second night, we got a little bit more under control because I knew what I was dealing with. Because you know, normally I always have her to help me put the kids to bed, and I didn't. So anyway, about Sunday or Monday of last week, I started feeling bad. Like, I was just like, oh, like, what is this? And I knew what it was. I was getting her cold, which is not a surprise. All of us, the, the other three members of our family, now have her cold and, you know, subsequent issues from that. And so I'm getting her cold. And listen, it's so funny because I had this thought the day after I preached about how husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. But I had this thought. I go, you know what? When she had this cold, she couldn't help me put those kids to bed. Mm. But I got this cold, and I'm going to suffer through it, and I'm going to put those kids to bed, and I'm going to show her. Mm -hmm. mm. And I had that thought. I was like, yeah, that's right. She's going to see me. I'm going to be scrubbing the kids down at night. I'm going to be cuddling with Avery, even though I could have a migraine, but I'm going to power through. Because the thought was like, hey, you know what? I, and this is just me being transparent with you guys. I'm better. You were better. That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, I'm better. Like, I got this under control. I'm better than her. Here's the problem. We both had the exact same sickness. Mm -hmm. 
It affected her differently than it affected me, but we both had the exact same different sickness. How silly is it of me to think I'm better than her when we're sick with the same thing? Like, isn't that just seem a little bit counterintuitive to you? The Bible says we're all sick. We all have the same sickness. It's a disease called sin. And it, it has been with us since birth. It is inside. It is, it is a fabric of who we are. We're that broken. And here's the thing about sin. It works itself out differently, just like the cold. My cold, I had a sore throat. Colleen's cold, same sickness. She had a migraine. Avery and Hadley had the cold. Avery's got an ear infection, and Hadley has pink eye. It's infecting and affecting all of us differently, but it's the same root problem. So when we see lists like this, what we've got to understand is that these lists are simply symptoms of a greater problem, which is sin. They're symptoms of the sin condition. And so people who find themselves on this list but don't find themselves as one who would, who would have the proclivity towards same-sex attraction and would engage in that lifestyle should have a difficult problem looking at those people and going, I'm better than you because they have the same sickness you do. Let's put ourselves on the same level, all of us, right? Don't raise your hand. But how many of you don't tithe? Don't raise your hand. How many of you are willing to come to church, but you're never willing to pray through your finances? My money is mine, and you've got this grasp, like death grip on your, on your money, and you're never willing to give. You're never willing to practice generosity. You're willing to buy crap that's outdated as soon as you buy it, and you can't get your money back for it, but you won't give to God's kingdom eternal purposes listen i'm not i'm not saying it's wrong to have nice stuff i'm just saying that our money doesn't belong to us and when we act like it does we're practicing greed anybody else in the room maybe i'm all alone but but what is true about that is if you're greedy you're on the list don't raise your hand anybody ever been drunk i don't believe that it's wrong to consume alcohol i believe jesus consumed alcohol but the scriptures are very clear that it's wrong to get drunk. Anybody ever consume too much alcohol? You're on the list. Drunkards is on the list. How about this? Anyone in this room ever used a cut down or derogatory term towards a homosexual? You're a reviler. You're on the list. And see, what that shows us is that we all have sin in our lives. And we shouldn't be willing to look at other people who struggle with certain sins that we don't struggle with and think that we're better than them. I'll even admit to you guys, I'm on the list. Paul talks about sexual immorality, and then he goes in 1 Corinthians 6.18, and he says this. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Now that word in the Greek that is used for sexual morality is a word called porneia. It's where we get our Greek word pornography from. And that word is used by Paul and used by Greek speakers to, as a catch-all term for any type of sex that is engaged with and the outside of heterosexual marriage. So that includes prostitution, that includes sleeping around with people you're not married to of the opposite sex, that includes pornography, that includes homosexuality. Anything the sinful, depraved human mind can think of. Paul says flee from that. Remember, don't be deceived in thinking that those things are right, but flee from those things. But I've been incredibly transparent with this church and talked about my struggles with pornography in the past. Incredibly transparent with you guys. And you know what? Pornography is a form of sexual morality. So is homosexuality. Now, doesn't it seem a little strange that somebody like me could look through eyes that have viewed porn in the past at disdain towards someone who struggles with same-sex attraction and is engaged in a homosexual lifestyle. The same eyes I've used to commit sin in the past, I would use to look down at somebody else who is struggling with that same type of sin. That's what Paul is showing us. See, we've got to understand what the Bible completely says about this. Because surely you've heard these little snippets here and snippets there about homosexuality, but what if we took the scriptures at its totality? We're all broken. We all need a savior. We all need redemption. 
We all need fixing. We all have broken desires. We all have broken bents. We were all born in sin. That's what the Bible shows us. So, in light of all those things, number two, how should we respond? How should we respond? Now, let me be very clear. So we're all on the same page. I do believe that engaging in homosexual acts is a sin. In the same way I believe that viewing pornography is a sin. In the same way I believe that being greedy is a sin. In the same way I believe that lying is a sin or committing murder is a sin or, or being self-righteous and religious is a sin. But I do believe the Bible clearly teaches that it's a sin. But how should we respond as the church? Because I know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to my church. So how should we respond? Well, Jesus helps us. We should be thankful for that because he does say this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, When you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite! Jesus didn't mind telling it like it was. You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Letter A, how do we respond? Remove the plank. Remove the plank. A couple months ago, I had a hernia surgery, as I've mentioned pretty much every sermon since then. So <laughs> I know you are excited to hear about it again. But they gave me some painkillers, and they worked. But the painkillers had a couple side effects. And one of the side effects of the painkillers was that I couldn't read things close up. They said, you might have difficulty reading things close up. And so I'd be like playing on my phone, and all of a sudden I felt like I aged 25 years. No offense. And so I'm like, you know, holding, holding this about here, I'm like, Honey, what does that say? I mean, I'm doing like that number. Like, some of you might have caught yourself at the restaurant doing that. I'm like, I can't, what in the world? I mean, like, I'm doing, it was a very surreal experience. And so, I'm playing on my phone, and since I can't see very well, I'm trying to hit stuff, and I'm not hitting the right thing. I'm not hitting the right thing, and so the phone's going somewhere it's not supposed to. And the reason for that is because when our vision is impaired, we don't do a very good job of doing whatever task requires vision, right? Yeah. What Jesus just said is that so many Christians who are hypocritical, we've got planks in our own eyes. You know what a plank does besides when you turn, knock everybody over? It impairs your vision. You can't see clearly to even address the issue in your brother's life because you got this big old thing that's hanging out of your own eye. You got like a two by four hanging out your eye and you're like, hey, let me help you with that. And you're knocking them over. And, you know, and so what Jesus just is showing us here is that we need to be people who were not willing to use the Bible as a battering rod, but as a mirror. And we're willing to look into our own lives and go, what sins do I need to repent of? What things are going wrong in my life that I need to lay at the feet of Jesus? And in doing so, we're removing the plank. To someone who struggles with same-sex attraction, to someone who's a member of the homosexual community, I honestly feel like the church owes you or owes them an apology. And the reason why is because so many of you, you've heard this before, right? Like you've heard pastors who will get up and they won't explain sin in its totality. They'll use little cheap shots and derogatory terms toward homosexuals to get a laugh from their pharisaical con con congregations. I mean, we've heard this where they say, well, you know, you might do this, but at least you're not that. And you're like, well, I mean, hold on. Let's, let's see what we're talking about here. I've seen Christians on social media say some of the vilest things about people who have a soul, who have a story, who have families, and who matter to God. I've seen people treat people who have the proclivity towards same-sex attraction, Christians, professing Christians, treat them as if they are subhuman. As if they are some sort of like slime that came out of the lake instead of an image bearer of God who has inherent dignity, value, and worth. And we as a church should stop that. Because you wouldn't want somebody to treat you in your sin like that, would you? That is not even remotely Christ-like. Okay, so in Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, the religious people viewed tax collectors and prostitutes in the same way that many people in today's religious community would view, view homosexuals. I would love for you to show me, using your Bible, an incident where Jesus used a derogatory term, a slang term, or treated a prostitute or a tax collector as if they were subhuman. 
What does Jesus do? Jesus embraces them with truth and with love. I love Jesus because he's willing to tell them the truth. Hey, you're a sinner in need of repentance and people who struggled with that sin just kept coming to him. Why? Because the love was just oozing from him as he told them the truth. And so many of us, it's not love that oozes from us. It's vile and it's hate that comes from our mouths. It needs to stop. And some of us in this room, we need to repent of the way we've talked about people people, image bearers of God, who Jesus loves. I put this on social media a couple weeks ago, and I still think it's so true. It was the people that the religious community was marginalizing that were the most ready to come to Jesus. Prostitutes and tax collectors, man, they were, it was the, that was Jesus' crew. That's who he hung with. That's who he ran with. And all the religious people are like, I can't believe you would run with those people. And Jesus is like, they're repenting. They want to come to me. They want to see life. They want to know life. And here's the thing that really scares me. Imagine somebody in the world who struggles with same-sex attraction and the way that we've talked about homosexuality as if it's not just a sin, but it's like the sin and you're not a human. Imagine them thinking, man, I wish there was something more for me in this life than that because I'm not being satisfied. Oh, wait, I can't come to Jesus because his people hate me. Oh, there's nothing short of demonicness about that. That we would, instead of building a bridge for the gospel, burn it down. Some of us in this room, I believe a lot of people just within the church, we need to just repent and recognize that Jesus saved us out of our nastiness. Why should we be willing to condemn others in theirs? Another scripture I'll refer you to is the story of the Good Samaritan. Many of you have heard the Good Samaritan referenced in in life, and and that story actually comes from something Jesus told. And it's found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And Jesus tells a story about a man who was walking on a road, and two robbers came upon him and basically beat him close to, like, near death, left him for dead. And on that road, there walked a, a priest, like the upstanding religious man, the priest, And he just walked by the dying man, didn't lift a finger to help him. And then Jesus Jesus continues to tell the story, and he says, then a Levite came by. Now this is like upstanding religious community person. Surely he's going to help the guy who's laying on the street. And God just walks right by. And then Jesus is telling his Jewish audience, he says, then comes a Samaritan. And that religious audience would have gone, a Samaritan? Because we hear that, we're like, what a Samaritan, what's the difference? Listen, a Samaritan, according to Jewish people, was a half-breed, they were subhuman, and they just really needed to be wiped out. They were the enemy. And then Jesus says, you know what that Samaritan did? He helped him up, he took him to an inn, and he nursed him back to health, paying out of his own pocket to see this man recovered from health. And Jesus tells this entire story in response to a man who asked him, the man comes up to Jesus and he goes, What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And the man says, who's your neighbor? And Jesus says, let me tell you about the Samaritan. And Jesus, what Jesus just showed us is that we're to love people who disagree with us, who would consider us their enemy, who would consider us wrong, who would disagree with us. We're still called to love them, best for them, to serve them, to, to build relationships with them, to practice hospitality towards them. That's what the Bible calls us to do. And when we're willing to love people who disagree with us, and we're willing to humbly approach others' sins from the perspective of, I'm broken, I'm messed up, then I believe, letter B, we can begin to engage. We can begin to take the speck out of somebody else's eye. Letter B, engage. Paul, in the book of Colossians, he gives us a great idea of what this should look like. He says, and he's talking to the church at Colossae. He says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, people who disagree with you, non-Christians who would have a different lifestyle than you. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt. What does that mean? You've got truth, the salt, the, 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 the preserving power of God's word, but you've also got grace right there, meaning I've received grace. I want this for you because you've disobeyed God in the same way I have. Let it always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to know how to answer everyone. And so if you're engaging somebody who would disagree with you on this topic, if I'm engaging somebody who wants to talk about this topic who would disagree with me, let me explain to you some of the things that I would say to them. Let Let me show you kind of the bridges I would try to build to help them get to the Bible and to see the wisdom of the Bible, even though they might disagree with me. My family has a 
15 year old BMW with 373,000 miles on it. And the reason that car is still running after a trip and a half to the moon is because my dad, yeah, literally like a trip and a half to the moon. My dad is extremely particular about how he maintenances his cars. So the manual says, change the oil at so-and-so thousand miles. Boom, oil's getting changed. Change the alternator, do it. Change the tires, do it. Change the brakes, do it. Change the radiator, do it. He's willing to do whatever it calls for to keep the car running because he understands that the person who manufactured the car know how, knows how it should operate and knows how it should be maintained. So when we go to the Bible, I've said this before if we talked about marriage, God created marriage and He created us and He knows how we should operate and He knows how we should continue to operate in order to see longevity, in order to flourish, in order to walk in the way that He's called us to walk. And to, di to go against the Word is to like go against the owner's manual. Oh, I don't need to change the oil. In fact, I'll just drain the oil. I think that's weighing my car down. Your car's not going to get very far. In the same way, when you, dis when you disobey God's Word and live in a way that it says you should not live, what happens is you begin to drift towards a place of destruction instead of a place towards life. And that could be a very slow drift. That could take almost all of your life or it could be in an instant. But many of us who've walked in rebellion against God's word, we know that to be true. And what we see in God's word is that homosexuality goes outside the boundaries that God intended for the human, the human being to operate. That's not how he intended for us to operate. Now, I understand that I just said a very, 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 probably the most controversial statement that you could say today, or at least one of them. I, I, I understand that that's true. But here's the thing that, that I know also to be true. If we begin to discount parts of God's Word, so let, just go on a journey with me. Say you disagree with me and you say, okay, Jason, I don't believe that Romans 1 means what it says. Okay, you, that's fine. I'm glad you're here. We can have that conversation. But if you don't agree with what Romans 1 says, and you say, Paul, that, that's outdated. That, that part about relationships is outdated. Okay, well, let's say in about 100 years, as society continues to progress, the society begins to say it's okay for a 52-year-old man to marry a 5-year-old boy. Mm. Now, nobody in this room is probably thinking, that's a great idea. We should implement that. We should allow for that. Most of us are thinking, that's disgusting. But if you're not willing to say that the Bible is truthful about homosexuality, the problem is then you're like, what do you say? Oh, well, you know what? That's not right. Well, who are you to say that that's not right? Because I'm my own authority in the same way you're your own authority when you go against, the, when you go against God's Word. See, what's so great about God's Word is it always brings us back to sinner. It always brings us back to where we need to be. And when, when we begin to jettison and say, you know what, I don't believe God's word is truth, then everything ultimately becomes okay because you lose all moral authority to say that something is wrong because you've already said that the Bible is wrong because you feel like something's right for you. Well, what if somebody feels like something's right for them that, they, that you don't necessarily agree with? That's why we go back to the truth of God's word. The other argument I've heard is that, Jason, that's just the wrong side of history. History is progressing this way, and you're standing on the wrong side of it. Listen, my friend, listen. One day, Jesus Christ is going to bring history to a close. One day, he's going to split the sky open, and he's going to come back. And he's going to fix everything that's broken, and he's going to wipe away every tear from every eye. And to be on the wrong side of history on that day is not what, whatever sexual orientation you are, but it's, do you trust in Jesus? And what I want for everybody is not to be on the wrong side of history on that day. That's why we preach the gospel. That's why we share Jesus with people. That's why we're constantly inviting people to come to Jesus. Because on that day, I don't want you to be on the wrong side of history. On that day, I want you to stand and say, I trusted in Jesus. Now, for those of us who, who have been studying marriage, one of the things that you've seen me constantly bring out from Ephesians chapter 5 is that marriage is a picture of the gospel. When a marriage is clicking on all cylinders, which is very rare, but when a marriage is clicking on all cylinders and everybody's walking how they should walk within marriage, there's this beautiful picture of how Jesus loves his church and how his church reciprocates that love. And so marriage actually is one of, if not the most powerful illustrations we have to show the gospel to people. Now since that's the case, we shouldn't be surprised that our enemy Satan and the world are trying to destroy in one way or another marriage. We shouldn't be surprised that marriage, the, the uh, biblical idea for marriage will be constantly under attack. And I'm not just talking about same-sex marriage. I'm talking about rampant divorce, 
I'm talking about adultery. I'm talking about dysfunction within marriage. Marriage, the attack on marriage didn't start at Woodstock. It started in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and it's been under attack ever since then. And it will be until Jesus comes back and restores all things. But we shouldn't be surprised that whenever, whatever culture is living, that somehow marriage is going to get mistreated or misguided or misaligned in the way that it is intended to. And finally, let me spend a couple minutes talking about this and then we'll wrap up. To the person, and I've had conversations with good friends of mine, good friends of mine, who have same-sex attraction. People I love and care for. People that I've done life with for years. And one of the things that they'll tell me is that this is a desire that they have. This is something that is, that is, that is a part of who they are. And, and I'm not going to take that away from them. It is a part of who they are. But let me talk about desires just for a second. I love dessert. Woo! Like, give me some sort of, like, sugary, like, awesome dessert. I love it. In fact, I think Colleen and I are just going to go destroy one this evening. Like, I'm just so excited about <laughs> dessert. But here's the thing about desserts. I can't say yes all the time, right? I would love to eat dessert for every meal. I would love to. I have a desire to do that. But I can't do that because I know that if I gave in to that desire, I would not be in a healthy place before too long. In fact, anybody in this room, don't raise your hand, ever been on a diet? You ever said, you know what, I'm going to put myself on a diet. In putting yourself on a diet, what you're inherently saying is I'm restricting the food that I desire to eat. I desire to eat more food or different types of food than the food it is that I'm eating. But I know that my desires are ultimately leading me to an unhealthy place. I mean, anybody ever gone to the gym? Like many of us, we don't have necessarily a desire on most days to go into the gym, but we'll put ourselves in that, in that situation because we know that it's healthy for us to go against those desires. Now, I'm not trying to put eating a dessert and going to the gym on the same level as having this deep, intrinsic desire. But what I am trying to do is begin to get anybody who would have same-sex attraction and have a desire for that to begin to consider, I lay down other desires in my life because I believe that they're bad. And just because I have a desire doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. So, does that mean that this desire might also not be what God intended? That's what I'm beginning to get us to try to think about. Because here's, here's my thing. I would like to have sex with every pretty woman that would let me. If I'm just being honest, I, I would. But that's a desire I have. That's not something that is good at all. That's something that is sinful and something that is wrong. That's not something that is good. All of us have desires that we lay down. In fact, Jesus tells us we're going to have to do this. This is Mark chapter 8, verse 34. We studied this a couple weeks ago. Jesus said, In calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, deny himself, deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. What does that mean? You have certain desires, and if you're going to follow Jesus, you're laying down certain desires that you have. There's a man named Sam Alberry. He's a pastor from the United Kingdom, and he wrote a book. It's called Is God Anti-Gay? He has a unique perspective on the issue because he is a he professes that he has same-sex attraction. And he talks about in the book his journey with same-sex attraction and the Lord and how the Lord's working all of those things out and he writes something in his book. I want to just read to you. He says this, "Ever since I have been open about my experiences of homosexuality, a number of Christians have said something like this: The gospel must be harder for you than it is for me, as though I have more to give up than they do." But, that fact, but the fact is that the gospel demands everything of all of us. If someone thinks the gospel is somehow slotted into their life quite easily without causing any major adjustments to their lifestyle or aspirations, it is likely that they have not really started following Jesus at all. Every single Christian has to lay down certain desires. Lay down things they want to do at the feet of Jesus. I'll give you an example that's probably touched every person in this room. Forgiveness. 
Do we have a, a desire to naturally forgive somebody? Somebody who wronged you, somebody who cut you at the knees, somebody who talked bad about you, slandered you, when all you did was love them. Are you just going, oh, well, you're forgiven. I'll let that go. It's not a big deal. No, your natural desire is to harbor that bitterness inside of you. But God says, even though you have a desire to do that, Christian, what are you called to do? Forgive, 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 forgive. Why? Because that bitterness and resentment, if it's left inside, will eat you alive. That's because God knows that some of our natural desires aren't good for us. They're not good for us. But see, here's the good news. Here's the good news. We get so much back in return. Matthew cha Mark chapter 10, verses 29 through 30. We'll cover this in a couple weeks. But Jesus said this, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. What does Jesus say? You might have to lay down desires. You might have to lay down things to follow me. But I promise you, you'll get so much more in return. You'll get so much more in return. And so the person who is in this lifestyle or is struggling with same-sex attraction and you see Jesus asking you to lay this down as you give your life to him, I would tell you, you I'm sure it's a struggle. I don't even, I can't even comprehend what that looks like. But at the same time, he gives us so much more in return. Which finally, number three, is the invitation. The invitation. Let me read to you in its totality 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I just read through 10 earlier, but I want to read through 11 for, to drive home a point that we're going to close on. Verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at the first six words of verse 11. And such were some of you. And you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. What did Paul just say about the people who comprised the church at Corinth? He says, among you are the greedy, among you are the swindlers, among you are those who have stolen, and among you are those who had homosexual practices. In the church! People who had given their lives to Jesus, who are no longer defined by their sins, but are defined by Jesus Christ, His grace, His mercy, and His forgiveness. And if we want to be a church that looks like the New Testament church, I believe we should be a church with all different types of people in our church, with all different types of struggles, with all different types of proclivities, with all different types of pasts, and with all different types of baggage. And so to the person who has the proclivity towards same-sex attraction, I would say to you the same thing I would say to anybody else. Give your life to Jesus. We're not here trying to make you a heterosexual. We want you to become a Christ follower. Because when you become a Christ follower, I believe he'll start to change your desires. And he'll start to change your attitude. And he'll start to change the way you view things. And you'll begin to walk in a freedom you never knew was possible until you gave your life to Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, the Ellis family went to Disney World. Once again, that's another story y'all heard almost every facet about, but I'm still not done. We went to Disney World, and my parents went down there a day early, and then they came to pick us up at the airport when we got there, and they had rented a minivan. And so I'm driving in this minivan to Disney World with my two kids, and I'm like, when did this become my life? I am in a minivan <laughs> with two of my children on the way to Disney World. And so we're driving to Disney World and, and we get there and so we, we, we pull off the interstate onto like Disney property which is the size of Rhode Island. And so we get, you know, off the interstate and we get to our, the area of our hotel and we're about to pull in the parking lot and we go to the guard shack and my dad has one of those like little pieces of paper that say, hey, we're staying here, let us through. And so I show the guard that and he goes, okay, we're glad you guys are here. And then he says, welcome home. Started thinking that's an interesting thing to talk, say about Disney World because Disney World is a resort. Disney World is a resort with all different types of people from all different places in the world, like literally all over the world. All different ages, all different types of people, all different locales that they come from. It's this crazy hodgepodge group of people in this one place, and yet this guy says to me, Hey, welcome home. I'm like, okay, cool. So we 
park the minivan, and then I get all 17 suitcases that we have, because even though one of our kids weighs 15 pounds, then needs 3,700 pounds worth of luggage, and so, you know, just kind of carrying this stuff in, and go to the front desk, and we go to check in, and the lady's telling me where everything is, here's the pool, here's the gym, here's how you get to the parks, here's a map, here's this, here's your key, blah, 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 there's where your room is, and then she looks at me afterwards, and she goes, welcome home. Not interesting, welcome home, okay. And so we go down to the room, and we put Avery down for a nap, and Hadley down for a nap, and Colleen goes to my parents' rooms to get supplies. Supplies, that made it sound like we're going on the Oregon Trail. She went to my parents' room to get food, and so she, she's out of the room, and I'm just kind of sitting there, and I'm thinking about just kind of the whole day, and I'm pretty exhausted, and I start thinking about, welcome home. And I start thinking about the fact that Disney World is, like I said, this place of all different types of people from all different types of background. But yet Disney World wants you to feel at home regardless of who you are because we have one commonality, which is we're at Disney World. Welcome home. And the thing I see about the church, the thing I understand that is true about the church is that we're a people from all different backgrounds with all different types of proclivities with all different types of temptations and struggles and all different types of pasts and, and all different types of interests and all different types of skin colors and, and we're from all over the world but there's a commonality between all of us and that is that we have given our lives to Jesus and if you have given your lives to Jesus as the pastor of this church regardless of your sin struggle hear me say to you the same thing that God told me welcome home and sometimes we got to do family business since we're home and some of us in the family, we need to do some business with the Lord today. Because we might have been those people who would be willing to revile other people who struggle with different sin struggles. And maybe that's you in this room. But remember, we're a part of a family. We help each other grow. We walk with each other. We don't give up on each other. And some of you, you might be in here and you're, you're outside the family, but you're looking to see what the family's like. And maybe one of your, a part of your story is same-sex attraction. And you disagree with me about everything I just said. But I want you to hear as the pastor of this church, I love you and I'm glad you're here. And I'd love for you to bring your questions. I'd love for you to bring your concerns. I'd, it's fine that you disagree. I'm glad you're here. Let's continue to have a conversation. And maybe you're in this room or you're watching this online and you're saying, you know what, that is a part of my story but I see what Jesus has to say about it, and I don't know what it's going to look like to leave behind this lifestyle and leave behind the people, but I know that Jesus is good, and I know he wants to forgive me, and I know he wants to walk with me, and I know he wants to give me more than I could ever imagine, and I want to give my life to Jesus. To you, I would say on behalf of this church, welcome home. Let's pray.